Is this it? Where is everyone today? I called off 354. Was that the was that the mistake? So everyone went home. circuit 
that you can use um, for implementing second order low pass stages. So it looks like this. Now, I'm not going to go through the analysis of the circuit. He does that in the textbook. It's not that hard, but it's a little bit time consuming. So you just use the op amp analysis procedure that we went through previously. So this is this is an, uh, this will actually you can use this to implement a second order low pass filter section. It's called a Salem key circuit, or in this particular with this configuration, it's it's a low pass filter. So if you swap the resistors and the capacitors, you, you get a high pass filter. Um, the transfer function, which is what we're interested in, is one over R1, R2, C1, C2 over S squared plus one over C1, one over R1 plus one over R2, S, and then the same term that's in the numerator appears in the denominator. R2, C2, C1, C2. Now, this is a low pass filter. Um, uh, for a low pass filter, we could have an arbitrary gain in, in, in this. But this particular transfer function, if you evaluate it at low frequencies, at omega equal to zero, Remember, substituting J omega for S, but in omega equal to zero, equivalently S equal to zero, this would have a gain of one. And at very high frequencies, um, you're going to have the S squared term dominate the denominator. So omega squared, it would have 40 dB decade per roll off. I mean, there, there's some classic second order configurations that. Um, Plus two alpha s plus omega c squared. That's the second order low pass. And if you take the limit, you know, with an arbitrary multiplying gain factor k at s equal to zero, that would have a gain of k. Okay, but it has a low pass response because at very high frequencies, as s becomes infinitely large, the denominator becomes large. Okay, this is a low pass. For a second order high pass, the only thing that changes actually is the numerator. The denominator is actually the same for all of these second order circuits. Now this is a high pass because at low frequencies we have a zero in the numerator. At low frequencies, the denominator becomes omega c squared, but the numerator goes to zero, so the filter response would be zero. But at high frequencies, we've got an s squared over s squared, or a one, and so the overall gain would be one. So the response of this first one you know, looks like, if we drew it on a linear scale, it's going to look like this. This is omega c. This one. Looks like this, a high pass response. These are second order circuits, but can, you can implement any order filter that we'll ever encounter, like all the Butterworth. And a 10th order Butterworth is going to be five two second order sections. Right, we're going to combine the, the poles, and I'll show you how to do that. You know, a ninth order Butterworth is going to have four second order sections and a single first order section. Okay. There's actually, we can also this one's maybe a little harder to identify, but this one with S 
So again, just changing the numerator, constant in the numerator, low pass, S squared in the numerator, high pass. A single S actually gives us a bite, a band pass response. So if we let S be J omega C, then S squared is going to be minus omega C squared. And the omega C squared terms would cancel out in the denominator. And we're left with two alpha J omega C or two alpha J omega C or, or one. Actually, I put this, this K term in here. So the gain on these would actually be K instead of one. Okay. And for the band pass, it's gonna look like this. Um, you can actually get a band reject by adding the low pass and high pass filter response. So have an S squared plus omega C squared in the numerator would give a, a band reject response. With this particular circuit, if you go through the analysis in terms of the components, it's a low pass response, you know, constant in the numerator. Now, so we can use this, let's go back to where we were with our third order Butterworth. And this is where we ended on Wednesday. A third order Butterworth has a first order section. And for you know fifth order Butterworth or sixth order Butterworth, what will change actually in every case is the multiplier for the S term and the denominator. Um, all the others, all the second order sections look exactly like this. I actually have the same term in the numerator. S squared plus this term depends on the angle of the pole. Okay, so the only difference between all of the second order sections is the coefficient multiplying the S and the denominator. So I forgot actually what frequency we were using. So I just said we're going to design for a cutoff frequency of 20,000 pi. So that would correspond to 10,000 hertz or 10 kilohertz. So the, the goal here is to come up with a low pass filter that has a cutoff frequency of 10 kilohertz. So we can use the Salen key circuit for the second order second order sec section or second order section. Um, it doesn't look all that easy. We have to find R1, R2, C1, C2 component values that match this expression. Okay, omega C squared here and here and omega C there. And we can see that the omega C squared, if it's here, it's going to be here. We can have an arbitrary, we could have an arbitrary gain. We could get that with an additional op amp stage. Um, what we have to do comparing our filter equations to our desired second order response, we see that we need this term to be equal to omega C and we need one over R1, R2, C1, C2 to be omega C squared. So we've only got two equations here to satisfy, and then the and omega c is known. That's the twenty thousand pi. That's our cutoff frequency. We've got two equations and four unknowns: r one, r two, c one, and c two. So you typically have some leeway here. Um, usually on the Salem P, we'll just set the two resistors equal to one another. Let them be equal to r. And so this first equation, you can rewrite it. This would become two over R, but we can rewrite it in terms of what we need C1 to be. C1 would be 
2 over r omega c then. And then we can solve the second equation for c2. It's 1 over 2 r omega c. Okay. Now at this point, again, omega c is fixed. You can pick a value of resistance if you want it. And that would set the, the two capacitance values. Um, I just somewhat arbitrarily let C1 be one nanofarad, standard value of capacitance, and solve the first equation for R. So R is then 2 over C1 omega C, or 31.831 kilo ohms. And then solve this equation for C2. C2 turned out to be 0.25 nanofarads. Now, actually, you usually go back a little bit back and forth here. You know, I think the first value of capacitance I chose was like 10 microfarads. When I plugged that in, I got a three ohm resistor or something, you know, just a too small resistance value. Um, the resistances are going to affect the input impedance. We haven't really talked about that. But that resistance was too small. So um, I used a smaller value of capacitance. I'm sorry, of, of capacitance, so I get a larger value of resistance. So you play around here with your initial value of capacitance until you get reasonable resistance values, you know, typically something in the, in the kilo ohm range. So hopefully this design would take care of the second order section. The other thing we need is the first order section. We looked at, we looked at first order active low pass circuits. Oh, I don't know, it was a couple weeks ago now, I think. So the first order section use this particular circuit. CF, this was RS, this is VI, this is VO, and this was figure 616 on page 272. The Salem key circuit is also in the textbook in this section, but this was uh, this circuit was from a previous section in the textbook on this on this particular page, and I think we actually went through the circuit analysis to solve for the transfer function on this one. It's minus g omega c over s plus omega c. Again, for a, a first order filter, kind of the analysis is the same. Uh, at s equal to zero, this becomes one. This is a low pass filter. First order high pass has just an s in the numerator, s over s plus omega c. There is no such thing as a first order band pass or a first order band reject. Well, I guess you could get them by, by adding and subtracting uh, first order sections. And the parameters here are related to the circuit components. G here is the, the gain at DC. Because again, with S equal to zero, this term becomes one. So we can, we can design for a particular gain here by letting R, the RFRS ratio be whatever. And then the omega C value is determined by the resistor and capacitor and the, and the feedback component and the feedback portion of the circuit. So this, this is a lot easier to, to pick values for. We want it to match. Here we've got an overall gain of one. So we just need to pick omega C. Uh, so again, we've got really three component values defined and two knowns, we want omega C to be 20,000 pi. And we want G to be one. So you're free to kind of pick one. 
I just let CF be one nanofarad again. RF we get from this equation is one over omega C CF or 15.915 kilo ohms. And then for a gain of one, we want RS equal to RF equal to 15.915 kilo ohms. Now, there was, there was a bit of algebra here and some math and, and calculating these values. It's easy to make a mistake somewhere along the way. So before you go off and, and build 100,000 of these circuits, you know, you want to you build a prototype. Actually, typically before you go to the build stage, you'd simulate using like LT spice, right? And so simulation allows you to build a, a circuit model and test the model pretty quickly without having to drag out a, a, a breadboard. So I, I didn't want to take the time to build this in class, um, but this is that first order circuit with the values, the 15.915K and the C1. So this is that first order section the implementation of, of this. And then this is the Salen P section with the resistance and capacitance values that we calculated. For the op amp here, I just used, it, it's, kind, it's kind of a, an idealized op amp. It's usually where I start. And then, um, then plug in a more realistic model of, of op amp. And further testing. What's nice about the idealized op amp here, you don't have to hook up power supplies to a, a DC power supplies. And then, so just doing, I want to look at the frequency response, right? We're trying to design a low pass filter. So I want to do an AC analysis and I just look at the frequency response. Well, here, um, this is how you set up. So we can do the different types of analysis and do the transient to see what looks like in the time domain. But here I want to I want to see the you know essentially a Bode plot. Okay. Um, here I chose to do a decade sweep with 40 points per decade. So um, you could also it doesn't really matter. That's just a way of how it's going to this simulates at a number of different frequencies, calculates the output at a number of different frequencies. It's actually going to calculate the output at 40 points per decade. How many decades am I going over there between 1K and 100K? That's two decades. Decade above 1K is 10K, decade above that. So essentially, it's going to do the simulation at 80 points, calculate the response at 80 points. Fortunately, it does it really quickly. So if we run the simulation and then I'm going to probe the output. Okay. And then it, it gives me both the magnitude response and the phase response. I'm not really interested in the phase response. Actually show the grid that will help. The other thing that you can optionally do is somewhere I can mark the data points here. These are the 80 calculation points. And then all LT Spice does is draw a straight line between your 80 calculation points. If I calculate the number of dots here over a decade, there should be 40 dots there, but I'm not going to count them. But what we should have, two things we should notice, if our design is correct, it looks like it's, I don't know what it's doing. Um, if our design is correct, at 10 kilohertz, we should be down at minus 3 dB. Remember, that's that's the definition of our cutoff frequency. So it appears to be you know, spot on there. The other thing is, this is a third order Butterworth, a third order filter. So we should have 60 dB per decade roll off and the stop band. Now remember, with our idealized Butterworth filter, went to here and then 60 dB per roll, 60 dB per decade, but here's a decade. So this should be down at minus 60 dB 
which it is. So pretty easy. Um, pretty easy to actually do Butterworth filter design. Pick your circuit order. The higher the order, the steeper the roll off here in, in, the, in the stop band, essentially. But you can get pretty good performance with you know, uh, just even a second order Butterworth. Now, if I went you know, the next stage above the third order would be a fourth order Butterworth. For a fourth order Butterworth, what am I going to have? I'm going to have uh, two poles here and here, and another pair there. Okay. Again, from my table uh, and the normalized, they're going to be on the on the unit circle. You know, I pair them up okay, so that I would get second order terms that look like that. The only difference in, in them would be, you know, what, what's this coefficient here? So I'd have different, but each stage I could build out of a Salem P section. Just need different resistors and capacitors for the, the two sections that make up that. For a 10th order bottle worth, I need five op amps. We got five second order sections there. Um, so any questions on that? At some point, you guys might have to build a filter, um, a low pass, a low pass filter. At some point, low pass filters are fairly common as are band pass filters. Um, occasionally, you want a high pass filter. So I'll, I'll just give you the steps here um, because we actually start with the low pass Butterworth and do what's called a low pass to high pass transformation. So we find a desired end order normalized Low pass filter by pole placement and then finding the angles or just looking them up in the, in the table, table six three, you know, which was a table of all the angles there. So we end up with the SA here indicates that it's normalized. You end up with a Transfer function, and it looks like this e to the j theta i, where the theta i is just the angle of the different poles. Okay. You combine the conjugate pair terms. So now I'll have, I'm assuming N is, is even here. If N is odd, you would have a first order term, you know, the pole at minus one that you'd pull out from the product. You'd have an, uh, one of the theta I's would be 180, and this term would be either the J180 would be minus one, and you'd have a say plus one term. But if, if you, we did this last time, e to the j theta i, if you multiply it by its complex conjugate, what you get is you get an SA squared term. And then you'll get this minus SA times e to the j theta i and a minus SA times e to the minus j theta i. That becomes a minus two cosine theta i s. And then if you multiply these two together, that actually just becomes a plus one. Now, because our theta i's are, theta i is this angle, so those cosine terms would all be negative. 
So cosine data, this cosine data I would all be negative with our poles in the left half plane. So this coefficient actually will turn out that it would be a positive coefficient once you've plugged up the actual angle in there. So what you end up here is SA squared minus two cosine theta I S plus one. So again, for this, for this case, this fourth order case, we've got two theta I's there. And um, I do, and you could look for a fourth order case. The poles are going to be um, 180 degrees divided by four, so 45 degrees apart. Right? But there's for the even case, uh, they're symmetric about the negative real axis. So this is 45 degrees, but this is. It's 45 degrees here, but you're 22 and a half above the negative real axis. So this would be 22 and a half. So if you looked at the location in the table of that first pole, it's going to be 90 plus 22 and a half. So it's at 112.5. And then the, the angle for this other pole would be um, that plus 45 degrees. And you can look those up. But these now are your, well, this is the normalized version. Um, we're actually going to, in the next step, now in the low pass design, you would just denormalize this and then implement the circuit using Salem key sections. To get the high pass with low pass to I pass transformation. And I'll use an SB here in indicating this is still a, a normalized transfer function. We get it from our normalized low pass by substituting N for SA one over SB. This actually is not specific just to Butterworth, for example. This would work for any low pass transfer function. If you make that, if you make that substitution, you'll get a, a corresponding high pass filter. In this case, you'll get one that has actually the same cutoff frequency, but it flips it around. So for example, if we, if we look at one of our second order sections, SA squared minus two cosine theta I SA plus one, and we substitute in one over SB for SA here, now, what we end up with, we'd end up here with an SA over SB squared. I'm sorry, a one over SB squared if we make that substitution. I'm gonna multiply through numerator and denominator by SB squared. When I do that, that'll be a one, but this will become an SB squared. So writing it in standard form. Here I would have a one over SB, but when I multiply it through by SB, and then plus one, and then in the numerator again. But this is, if you recall, that's a high pass filter now with that transformation. I skipped a few steps of algebra. If I lost you there, I encourage you to substitute in for SA one over SB, and then multiply numerator and denominator by SB squared, and you'll get this. Okay. So this is a technique for taking a low pass transfer function and transforming it into a, a high pass transfer function. So each of these second order sections would be transformed. I equal one to n over two, SB squared, 
SV squared minus two cosine theta i, SV plus one. And there's, we denormalize And our normalized circuit actually has an omega C of, of one. And we denormalize and get our final desired transfer function by substituting S over omega C and for SB and then also multiplying by this constant in the, in the front to keep it, then that will actually keep the gain the same. If you do that, pulling the, the C out one to N over two, you get an S squared, S squared minus two cosine theta I Omega C S plus Omega C squared. Can I did the same thing? You plug in S over Omega C for S B, but then I multiply numerator and denominator by uh, Omega C squared. And actually, I, I pulled an Omega C um, squared for each of these sections or second order sections. So that this is a high pass filter with a high pass gain of one. That's that's why this multiplication by this constant is necessary. Um, so this is the high pass transfer function. And the book he has you multiply all this stuff together, but you never do that because you're actually interested in keeping the second order sections because we're going to implement it as a series of second order sections. And that's, that's the last step. Implement second order high pass sections using a high pass Salem key. There, there are other Oppium configurations that have classic names as well, in addition to Salem key with various advantages and disadvantages. The Salem key is a particularly nice one to use. And to get a high pass Salem key, you just swap the resistors and capacitors and the low pass sailing key to obtain high pass sailing key. Okay. Now the transfer function is not the same as I have over there because it would have an S squared in the numerator. Essentially what you can do is, is uh, swap the impedances everywhere I have an R1, I replace it with a one over S C1 Everywhere I have a C1, I would replace it with uh, one over SC1 would become R1. So everywhere I have a C1, I would replace it with R1 over S or through the algebra. You'll get the equivalent high pass transfer, fun transfer function. So essentially, I'd have, for the high pass, I have a capacitor here, and this R2 comes here, and R1 gets swapped with C1 and then it becomes a, a high pass filter. Um, <coughs> if you want to band pass Butterworth, we've talked about doing this before. This is an easy way without taking a course on filter design it's just cascade a low pass filter and a high pass filter. So, you know, essentially what I have is a low pass filter that looks like this, and then a high pass filter with a lower cutoff frequency 
omega HP, my cutoff for my high pass, and omega low pass. What I get is the product of these two when I put them in cascade, right? But <laughs> my high pass filter has a response of zero down here. So, and my low pass filter has a response of zero above you know, this frequency. So the product is actually going to look like this. I'll get a I'll get a band pass response. You have to make sure that your cutoff frequency for your high pass is actually below the cutoff frequency for the low pass. If it's not, you get nothing out. So that's an easy way to, to do that. Um, I'll just briefly mention, and then we'll get out of here. I showed, I think last week, a simulation of filtering a trumpet signal using, that had noise, and we used the low pass filter. Well, low pass filter actually isn't ideal for that trumpet signal. Because the, trump, the trumpet signal you know, filtered out harmonics in the trumpet signal, so it didn't sound good. Um, we looked at actually, uh, another case where there were two notes and we used a cone filter you know a band reject filter essentially that filtered out one of the notes and passed through the other one alternatively especially in the presence of noise you can use what's a, what's known as a resonator filter it's kind of the inverse of a cone if you remember the cone filter uh, we had zeros here on the axis and closely spaced. So it would be like J omega zero, J two omega zero, minus J omega zero, minus two J omega zero. And this distance was minus alpha. And the response for that looked like, I'm just gonna draw the one-sided response, but because of the zero on the J omega axis, This was the cone filter magnitude response. So real and imaginary. So these are the poles and zeros. And first we looked at just a pole zero pair and that gave us a, you know, a single band reject filter. And we could, you know, by continuing this, we could get additional it's called a cone because this kind of looks a little bit like the teeth of a cone, right? So the, the way to get a resonator response is one minus the cone response. So the cone response Now it has, it will be a product. We've got zeros at J omega zero, and then the poles at minus alpha. Um, actually, we're doing integer multiples for K equal minus N to plus N, and we're skipping. I mean, you could put one at DC if you wanted one, but I'm just skipping that term. So this is the zero at K omega, and then this, this is the poles at minus alpha and plus J K omega zero. And I'm letting K be positive and negative here. So we get the J omega zero term. In this case, when K is equal to one and the minus J omega zero term when K is equal to, to minus one. So this would correspond to this picture with capital N is equal to two. The resonator response is just one minus that. What the resonator would look like is this. Two omega zero, 
and it would have a peak of one. So you could set this up so it would pass for a periodic signal. It would pass the fundamental and the harmonics. These types of filters are a little bit unusual unless you're working you know, specifically with musical tones, things that may, or periodic signals that may involve um, harmonics. Much more frequently, we're interested in just in high pass or low pass or band pass filters or band reject. But these are, you know, these are kind of interesting in, in, in terms of playing around with them and what, what you can do with, with musical tones. Okay, to finish out the chapter, we, we're, we're going to talk about on Monday, we'll talk about actually modulation. So, which is related to AM and FM radio, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. And, and we should have a pretty good idea of how amplitude modulation works, at least theoretically, um, next week. And then uh, we'll also look at, at sampling. So, transitioning from analog signals into digital signals. And uh, digital signal processing. And I know those of you, those of you who are computer engineers, are probably not taking digital signal processing this spring. Usually, you're not. You can't because of your schedule. But I really, I would encourage you to take it as an elective, perhaps next year, your, your senior year. Um, there's a lot of programming. You know, I think. I, I think it should probably be a required course actually for computer engineers. Yeah, I see you guys electrical. No, no programming. It's not lab programming. So, so it's, I don't know if that's better or worse. But um, we do actually some real, the intent is to do some real data processing with, with audio data there. Um, we typically do, uh, again, not lab programming. You could, you could actually implement it in C, but we don't. All right, have a good weekend. We're almost, we're almost done. Oh, if you already looked at the 354 project, I changed it a little bit to have you use the LCD display. I meant to do that, but forgot to include it in the, in the project description. So I just have you write out the brightness to the LCD display. So it's not that big of a change. Honey, did you do it?